Hey, well, friends, today we're starting a uh, a four-part series of messages that talk about um, the future of our church and clarifying the vision of our church. And so um, today we want to talk about the most important thing. But before we do that, I want to tell you that I never really wanted a tattoo. Doesn't mean I don't like tattoos or that I don't appreciate body art. I have liked some that I have seen and others not so much. That also does not mean that I do not like people with tattoos. I do. My dad had a tattoo on his forearm that he got in the army during World War II. It was a heart and it had a woman's name in the center. The woman's name was Mother. Smart guy, my dad. My oldest son has two tattoos that he hid from me for several months after he got them. I still call him my son. I did not disown him. There was this one time, however, when I toyed with the notion of getting a tattoo. I would have had it applied to my bicep on my left arm. I wondered how much it would cost. I really didn't want to spend money that way. But I never really discussed it with anyone, not even, and especially not my wife. The tattoo would have included nine letters pertinent to a subject that I was very passionate about. Those letters would have been R, P, G, N, X, slash, F, D, F, X. The subject meant so much to me that I never wanted to forget about it. And so then one day, I in fact gave in. And this is what I did. (laughs) Okay, I didn't do it. (laughs) Mark Golden, our communications director, photoshopped this for me. But by the way, my arms are actually that big. (laughs) No, they're not. Not yet. The letters are R, P, G, N, X, F, D, F, X. And here's what they stand for. They stand for reaching people with the good news of Jesus and becoming fully devoted followers of Christ. It describes the nature and the function of the church. I am so passionate about the church and its purpose that I almost had it permanently tattooed on my body because it is permanently tattooed on my heart. One day Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? And Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind and all of your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. And without being asked anything else, he said, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. These are the two greatest commandments. Upon these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. In other words, everything said and taught by Jesus and by the prophets and so forth is based on these two commandments. And then after Jesus was crucified and raised from the dead, he appeared to his disciples on a mountaintop in Galilee. And then he gave them this charge. He said, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. It is called the Great Commission. The Great Commandments, the Great Commission. And if you consider these passages together, then they teach us that we are to love God more than anything else. We are to love our neighbors a lot, as much as we love ourselves. We are to make disciples We are to help people become followers of Jesus. We are to lead people to Jesus. And we are to teach them to obey the teachings of Jesus. After I had been a pastor for 15 years or so, I began to wrestle more and more with the nature and the purpose of the church. I knew that the church was Jesus' idea that it began on Pentecost, which is 50 days after Easter. 
when the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples like tongues of fire, and that, and I knew that the church was intended to provide for the continued growth and development of the Christian faith and the transformation of the world. That faith was and continues to be that Jesus Christ, God's only Son, lived, taught, led by example, suffered and died for our sins, was raised from death to life on the third day, and provides for our salvation, provides for our forgiveness of sin, provides for our eternal life. But after that, after that, I became confused. Was the church's job to serve and to satisfy its membership? Or was it to tell other people about Jesus? Or was it to meet the physical needs of others? Or was it to care for its facilities? Or was it to feed hungry people? Or was it to be financially responsible so as to provide for the long-term existence of the buildings? Was it to reach out to others or was it to keep unto itself and to protect what it already had? Was it all of the above, some of the above, or none of the above? And who is to decide which it is? So I read and I studied scripture and I prayed and I listened for God. And I went back to the great commandments and the great commission and I considered those words. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart. And I asked myself, what does it mean to love God? And it means that we recognize and appreciate what God has done for us. He has given us life itself. He, God, has given us his son to die for our sin and to provide for our salvation. God has given his Holy Spirit to live in us, to guide us, to draw us unto him, and to always be by our side. And so we embrace God's love for us, and we love God in return. We express our love for God by trying to be obedient to God, by trying to do the things that he wants us to do, and by imitating the behavior and the character of Jesus Christ. God wants us to love him above all else. God wants us to love those around us, to tell others about Jesus, to encourage them to become followers of Jesus, and to teach them about Jesus so that we all may be more and more like Jesus. I examined what other churches were doing and why. I visited lots of churches and I noticed, I noticed a, surprisingly, a surprising similarity in their purpose statements because usually I could find the words like reach people and, and the good news of Jesus and, and make fully devoted followers of Christ. R-P-G-N-X, F-D-F-X. And that, and that made sense to me. It just made sense. It was the great commandments and the great commission all balled up together. So therefore, when I came here to Ingomar Church 11 years ago, I encouraged our leadership to reconsider our purpose. And they agreed to do that. And we sat down and we processed. And the result was that the purpose of Ingomar Church is to reach people with the good news of Jesus, and together become fully devoted followers of Christ. So how do we do that? We do that by being intentional and by being proactive. So let me tell you what I have observed about churches during my 40 years of ministry. It's not quite 40, it's like 38 or 39. No, it's 40. First of all, first of all, churches are great places to worship God. Great places to serve God. 
great places to meet Jesus and great places to teach people about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit. And, and they are full of wonderful people. But I also notice that sometimes they get stuck. Sometimes they forget why they exist. Sometimes they become self-centered and navel-gazing. And sometimes they get caught up in what they, the individual members of the church, want, and they lose track of what God wants for the church. And sometimes they try to do too much, and sometimes they're not willing to do enough. And sometimes someone does something that upsets someone else, and they leave the church, and they refuse to forgive that person. And when that happens, God's heart is grieved and... Satan rejoices. But that's not going to happen here, friends. That is not going to happen here. We are not going to be that kind of church. That is not what God wants for Ingemar Church. It is what Satan wants. It is not what God wants for Ingemar Church. Sometimes they want to keep the church the way it is or the way the church once was, or the way their church was when they were a child growing up, when the whole time God is trying to lead the church in a new direction to do even greater things. Sometimes the church tries to do everything at the same time in hopes of satisfying everyone, but which really satisfies no one. Friends, we must go where God is leading us to go. About five or six years ago, maybe more, I listened closely to a presentation by Robert Schnazy. He's a bishop in the United Methodist Church. And based on his observation and experience, first as a pastor and then as a bishop, he said, he said that there were five common characteristics that strong and highly effective churches had in common. Five things that those churches did really well. And he called them the five practices of fruitful congregations. And they were five practices of churches that bear fruit, churches that lead others to believe in and follow Jesus Christ, churches that get it right. They were five practices of churches that were getting it right. Many of you have heard of them before, some haven't. They are first and foremost radical hospitality. We are willing to go out of our way. We are willing to do whatever it takes to make you feel welcome and warm and wanted when you walk in the door to our church. The second one is passionate worship. We want to establish worship that is so good, worship that we sense God is present. Worship that is so inspiring and so engaging that our people can't wait to get there on Sunday mornings. And we want to have intentional faith development. We want learning opportunities that are different from the worship experience that help people to increase their knowledge and deepen their faith and enable them to build relationships with other people. And we want to practice risk-taking, mission, and service. We want to respond to the needs of others beyond our comfort zone, whether those needs be of a spiritual or a physical nature, whether those needs be locally or beyond our community or in places all over the world. And then the fifth one is that we want to practice extravagant generosity. Generosity toward the church and the needs of others that recognizes, first of all, that all things, Generosity that recognizes, first of all, that all things come from God. It is a generosity that is kind and considerate and unselfish and that it reflects the extravagance of God's love for us. So how are we doing? I think we're doing pretty good. And I think we're getting better and better, but we're not done yet. And we will keep working at it because we are living into what God is calling our church to be. But there is one thing, friends, that we must never forget. 
this one thing keeps coming back to me over and over again. This one thing is the most important thing, and it has a name, and its name is Jesus. Because you see, Jesus Christ is the most important thing. I believe, we believe, that next to being born, the most important thing that can happen in a person's life is that they would come to know who Jesus is. That came, they would come to recognize what Jesus has done and that they would just love Jesus for that. That they would accept what Jesus has done for them and that they would have a relationship with Jesus Christ. Because next to being born, the most important thing that can happen to a person in their life is that they would welcome Jesus into their life and that they would build a relationship with him and the church makes that happen and we believe that life we believe that all of life is better when Jesus is at the center of that life our job as a church is to keep the most important thing the most important thing Jesus first. At Ingemar Church, we make life better for others, and we do it first and foremost by helping them to find the handle on the door that leads to Jesus. And so, as we embrace, as we embark upon this, clarifying our focus on the future of our church, we want to begin with Jesus Jesus is first and foremost. And I want to ask you if you have acknowledged what Jesus has done for you and if you have accepted him as your Savior. And if you have done that already, then that's awesome. But if you haven't, I'm going to give you a chance to do that in a moment. But before I do that, I want you to know I was, I, I was, I was born into the church. I was born on a Monday, and the following Sunday I was in church. And I was in church almost every Sunday after that, except for some time when I was in college for a couple of years where I drifted away from the church, and then I returned to the church. But because I grew up in the church and because I was raised in the church, I never really had somebody, I never really understood what it meant to accept Jesus or to or to accept him as my savior, or to give my life to him. Those are all phrases that we've heard, right? Or to be born again. But what it means is this. I think, I think, that each and every one of us must come to a moment in our lives where we recognize that we are the recipients of what God has done for us through Jesus. And so when someone talks about have you accepted Jesus or have you made Jesus your savior? What I take that to mean is, have you acknowledged? Have you, are you aware of what Jesus did and that he did it for you? And most of you would say, well, sure. Well, sure, I get that. I'm also aware of the fact that there are new people who come to our church all the time. So even though I, know, I may know the spiritual nature of, of most of you here, I don't know what, where everyone is, and there are new people coming all the time. And so if you've not done that, if you've not acknowledged Jesus as your Savior, if you've not accepted Christ, if you've not recognized what Jesus has done for you, then I'd like to give you a chance to do that. So we're, Don's going to play some music in a moment here. And during that during that that musical time, I want you to think about yourself and I want you to think about Jesus. So I'm not going to ask you to come forward. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand. But I am going to ask you that if you would like to accept what Jesus has done for you, that you would pray this prayer to Jesus in the silence of your heart. And we're going to put that prayer up on the screen. So let's do that now.
Lord Jesus, I am grateful for what you have done for me, for the gifts you have given me, for your love, for your sacrifice, for the forgiveness for my sin, for my salvation and eternal life. And I accept your gifts, and I accept you, and I wish to be a fully devoted followers of yours. Amen. Friends, if you prayed that prayer, um, please tell someone. Maybe jot it down on your Connect card or tell me. And congratulations. And please be sure to come back next week for part two. I want, I want to, you to give your attention to the back of the Connect card. We would love for it if you would memorize Matthew 22, verses 37 and 39. Um, and with that you would wrestle with your own relationship to Jesus to make sure that you have accepted what Christ has done for you. And then um, pray for each other and pray for our church and pray for this series of messages as we seek to discern where we are going.